Everybody, today we are here for Gun Violence Awareness Day. And before I even start, I want to acknowledge who even woke us up and brought us here and got us here today. I want to thank you, God, for this opportunity to let us represent your love and your peace. We got a lot of people who are here to represent the end gun violence, senseless gun violence. And so, I want to bring up Mr. Mike Thompson, who represents California's 4th Congressional District. The district includes all parts of uh, Lake, Napa, Solano, Sonoma, Yola count, country, counties. He also was the first elected in 1998. Please give a hand to my brother, Mike Thompson. Rudy, thank you very, very much uh, for the nice introduction, but more important, thank you for what you're doing to the, for the community. For those of you who don't know, Rudy is a survivor of gun violence. He had been shot, and he is putting all of his energy into making sure that people have a great life and that our community is safe, so thank you. And I want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to thank all of my colleagues uh, who are here who understand how important this issue is. This is Gun Violence Prevention Awareness Month, the month of June. And today, we are here to let everybody know that this is a priority, this is important, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to reduce gun violence and to save lives. Every day, 30 people are killed by someone using a gun. And if you add suicides and accidents to that, the number goes up to 100 people a day. This year, there's been more mass shootings than there's been days of the year. And sadly, it's the number one cause, gun violence is the number one cause of death for children and teenagers. And it costs the taxpayers over $560 billion a year. Kids are on edge. They're afraid to go to school. Parents are afraid to drop their kids off at school. No place is safe. We've had mass shootings in every venue imaginable in every straight state across the United States. And it is an epidemic, and we're here today to say we can do something about it, and we need to do something about it. The folks on the stage with me today are all gun violence prevention champions. Every one of them has taken action. Every one of them has done something. And this is not a partisan issue, but you need to know, you need to know that Democrats in Congress have been fighting for gun violence prevention for seemingly ever. We've passed laws dealing with background checks, with red flag laws, trafficking of guns. We've passed laws for community violence uh, intervention to stop ghost guns and bump stocks. And we've been working on this every day. And sadly, the party that's in charge in the House today they have not quite the same record on guns as the Democrats do. Their record is, the last time they were in charge of the House, their big gun bill was a gun that allowed silencers to be bought over the counter. That's right. This year, this week, they brought legislation up dealing with guns. Their big bill this year is to allow short-barreled rifles to be legal in the United States of America. Both of these items are dangerous, they make our communities unsafe, and they'll increase the number of people who are killed because of gun violence. We know that we can protect the Second Amendment and we can make sure communities are safe. The two are not exclusive. You can do both. The American people know that. As a matter of fact, the American people know that so well, even Fox News poll shows that people want background checks by 87%. They want to increase 
They want to increase the age to be able to buy a gun to 21 years of age. 80% in the Fox News poll say that we should have red flag laws. And 61% of the people in the Fox News uh, poll say that we should ban assault weapons. The only place the only place that gun violence prevention is a partisan issue is in the halls and in the houses of the United States Congress. And we're here today to let the American people know that your voice is important and we need to hear your voice. Every member of Congress needs to hear your voice so they know that they should be voting for the issues, the bills, and the policies that will help keep people alive. So thank you all very, very much for being here. One more time, you guys, for Representative Mike Thompson. Thank you, Mike. Before I bring on my next speaker, I just want to acknowledge frontline soldiers who are fighting this battle daily. Ain't nothing more powerful than moms that man action. Give him a hand, y'all. Thank you guys for always showing up and showing out. I can't forget about my brothers from Urban Alchemy. Frontline soldiers, I see y'all risking your life on a daily, man. Bless your hearts. Five keys. Positive direction. The people who cleaned this street earlier was my guy, Ed, from Summer West CBD. Give him a hand, because this alley be toe up. And most definitely, I got to give a shout out to the mayor of Tenderloin, my guy right here, Dale Seymour. Thanks, Cole Tenderloin. Thank you for showing up. Okay, so I want to bring up a very powerful woman. She's the lieutenant governor of California. She's the first woman ever elected to be lieutenant governor of California from 2010 to 2013. Her name is Elena Kunalakis, please give it up for her. Thank you, Rudy. I hope I pronounced that, that right. That was perfect, Rudy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you for everyone at uh, at United Playas for for welcoming us today. Uh, and it is a great honor to be up here to be uh, with Moms Demand Action, to be with all the young people who are here as part of United Playas. The future is yours. That's what we're working for, but the legacy and the work will always be in the hands of the next generation. So don't forget that, that you are, you're gonna be up here next um, as we continue uh, the fight to make our country safer. So behind me, there are five members of the United States Congress, all uh, from the state of California. Some of the most important leadership in the United States, including and especially our very own Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker Emerita. And of course, Congressman Thompson, who brought us all here today, who chairs the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. Uh, as we know in the United States now, 120 people every day are lost to gun violence, and it is the number one cause of death for children in our country, and this is unacceptable, and we are gonna do something about it. So I'm representing the state of California, and so let me just say this, that the gun laws in the state of California are now the strongest in the country. We are in, rated number one uh, in gun safety because of our laws, and our laws are working. California is now, of the 50 states, we are 44th in the gun death rate, 44th lowest. We are 37% lower than the national average. It is safer statistically to be in California than 44 other states in the country. And it's because of the laws that we have. So we just heard Congressman Thompson talking about the things 
that Americans are for? Well, California has already done this. We already have a 10-day wait period. We already have background checks, not just for guns, but also for ammunition. We also require that you are 21 years old to purchase a gun in the state of California. And we have a ban on assault weapons in the state of California already. All these things together are showing that gun laws, sensible gun laws work. We're proving it in California. And the people behind us now with the leadership of the Speaker Emerita, Congressman Thompson, and the others on this stage are going to bring California's sensible gun laws to the rest of the country. So, Rudy, that's right. So, Rudy, uh, to all of you here, uh, we can do this. Please remember that California is leading the way. So when people say that, well, what can you do other than thoughts and prayers? No, no, no. Look at the state of California. We're doing it here. We're making it safer every day. And now we need Congress to bring the same kinds of sensible gun laws to the rest of the United States for all our people. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you so much. Give me a hand one more time to our Lieutenant Governor. Hey, people ask me, they say, what's your title? Right, Davis? I tell them, man, I'm a straight United player. I bring players together, right? I want to make sure that we acknowledge moms who lost their kids to gun violence. Miss Maddie Scott right here, give her a hand. Frontline soldier. Our district supervisor for two, Catherine Stephanie right here. And all my brothers who have came home behind that penitentiary wall that's fighting on the front line to end violence, period. Give yourselves a hand. I'm going to tell you, I know how I'm, I'm a player. This funky, stinking alley that we got right here, right, Dooney? I'm able to bring out, man, a, a powerful woman to this alley. This sister right here. Congresswoman Barbara Lee has been representing California's 12th district since 1998. She is the highest ranking African American woman appointed to the Democratic leadership, y'all. Without hands said, Barbara Lee, y'all. Go on, sister. Thank you, thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. First, thank you, Rudy, and uh, our United Players. Thank you, moms demanding action. Thank all of you so much for being here and especially thank you to those who have lo lost loved ones, uh, family members, friends, and those who have been traumatized by this epidemic of gun violence. Uh, because we won't let up. We won't let up until every single human being in our country is safe from these weapons of war and especially the assault weapons that we find. Yes, California is leading, but we have to have a national ban on assault weapons. Because if not, they bring them here. And so I want to honor and, and thank all of you. And I, I just have to say to our Speaker Emerita, yeah, I have been in Congress since um, 1998. She's never let up on issues of gun violence. And it's constantly led, regardless of the, of the pushback and regardless of the Republicans uh, really uh, lack of concern for saving lives. So I just want to thank her for her leadership when it wasn't all that popular, quite frankly, when it wasn't all that popular. So give her another round of applause. Yep. I've seen how she's done this, too. And, too, of course, Mike Thompson, our uh, chair of the Gun Violence Task Force, he's never let up. His history and his experience and his understanding of why we have to save lives through these common sense gun violence uh, laws uh, is remarkable. And he's educated so many members of Congress about the, the necessity for the laws that we're talking about in terms of red flags, safe storage, background checks, magazine capacity limits, banning uh, assault weapons. And so thank you again, Mike, for your leadership. And to all of my colleagues, <laughs> yes, give my, big, big Mike, Mike, big Mike, give him a round of applause. <laughs> And of course, to our uh, Lieutenant Governor and, and my colleagues from Congress, uh, this is a unified effort with you to save lives. Let me just mention a couple of things uh, with regard to uh, gun violence and the perspective which uh, I see this in terms of just being an African-American. Uh, you know, young black 
Americans age 15 to 34 experience the highest rates of gun homicides across all demographics. That's why United Players, thank you very much because we have to make sure that all of our children, uh, all of our children are, pre are safe from these uh, gun law, from these guns that we find on our streets. These ghost guns, for example. Uh, you can buy uh, the parts to make a ghost gun right. online. It's crazy. It is downright crazy. How do you do that? And uh, then go out and shoot people, and you can't even trace these guns. One of the efforts that we're working on in Congress right now is repealing what has been in the law for so long, and that is there's a 24-hour limit. It's called the t Hart Amendment that I want to just raise here because currently the FBI is required to destroy all approved gun purchase records within 24 hours. Within 24 hours. That is crazy. You're right. That inhibits law enforcement for in moving forward to investigate gun crimes expeditiously. These provisions must be repealed. They must be repealed. And so during National Gun Violence Awareness Month, we've got to recommit ourselves once again to fully ending the heartbreaking toll that gun violence takes on our communities. Thoughts and prayers, they're not enough. Moments of silence, they're not enough. Tweets and, and videos, they're not enough. We need action. We need action. And we know that everyone here is committed to action, but we need to let the Republicans and those who have been opposing saving lives all of these years, we need to let them know that enough is enough. And let's get our gun safety, our common sense gun safety laws passed through Congress to the President's desk because we're confident he will sign them into law. Thank you all again. One more time for the powerful Barbara Lee. Thank you, sister. I know we're getting into this alley, man. We're doing something right, huh? Ain't that right, book? <laughs> Come on now. Okay, hey, I want to bring up a representative. Jared Huffman represents California's second congressional district. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Thanks to all the amazing advocates here. Thanks to Big Mike Thompson. We're going to call him Big Mike now. Uh, and thank you to uh, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Not only has she been a champion on this issue, she had the good sense to put Mike Thompson in charge of our caucus's gun violence task force right after the terrible Sandy Hook tragedy. And this group of members of Congress has never stopped uh, working to make progress in the face of incredible resistance. Um, it's not easy. It takes a lot of knowledge that Mike brings. It takes incredible determination. Uh, it takes courage because the resistance is fierce uh, to making common sense gun policy reforms in the Congress. But we are going to stick with it. And when we look at all of you, this amazing community of survivors and advocates, um, it helps so much. I mean, your courage and dedication uh, is really the, the fuel we need to continue the fight in Congress. So thanks for doing this. Uh, you know, one of the things as a member of Congress that I get to do from time to time is meet with foreign leaders and members of parliament from Europe and other places. Every time I do that, the question comes up, has America lost its mind on guns? Some of them are afraid to travel to America or to allow their kids to travel or go to college in America. Uh, and I have to acknowledge that on this issue, we kind of have lost our minds. Uh, but together with all of you and my brave colleagues in Congress, we are taking our country back. And we're not going to stop until we do that. I want to uh, tell you a little bit about my district. It starts at the Golden Gate Bridge, goes all the way to Oregon, and includes beautiful, diverse communities and a lot of really remote areas. Um, I have the most Native American tribes of any congressional district in the contiguous United States. And when you get out into Indian country that I'm so proud to represent, uh, you also find that guns are a big problem. 
Uh, we have a lot of cartels that are operating, doing trespass cannabis grows on public lands, on private lands, sometimes on tribal lands. They are heavily armed. They are operating with impunity, and they are bringing gun violence into these Native American communities. Uh, guns are also a problem in other ways in Indian country. You may have begun to hear about the problem of missing and murdered indigenous people, the MMIP issue. You're starting to see documentaries and other consciousness uh, raising efforts. It's a huge scourge in Indian country all over the country and uh, it's a big deal in my district as well. Uh, a lot of factors go into this problem but guns often are at the heart of it. Uh, by the way, uh, in addition to gun suicide rates which have been rising staggering 34 percent within uh, Indian country over the last several years, uh, gun violence contributes to thousands of indigenous lives lost. More than half of all murders in Indian country are firearm homicides. So we cannot keep sweeping this under the rug. Guns are at the heart of the conversation when we talk about missing and murdered indigenous people. And like my colleagues here before you, like all of the amazing advocates that we are working with, we are never going to let thoughts and prayers be our only response to this scourge. We're going to take our country back and we're going to pass common sense gun safety legislation, including common, common sense background checks, comprehensive, and an assault weapons ban, and a lot more. So thanks for working with us and count on our continued efforts in Congress. We couldn't do it without you. I'm going to now hand off to uh, a new member of Congress who has hit the ground running. He is a great champion on this. Kevin Mullen. Thank you so much, Congressman Huffman, here to represent the freshman class in the United States House of Representatives. Honored to be with my colleagues and honored to be with so many advocates here who are building the political will so we can do something finally about this issue. Our country is unique in one of the most abhorrent and tragic ways. We lead the world among developed nations with the highest number of deaths from guns. We cannot become numb to the numbers that have been cited. 100 people a day die from gunshots. Guns are now the leading cause of death among children. As a father of five-year-old boys, that is shocking to me. This year, we've had more mass shootings than days. One of those mass shootings was in Half Moon Bay on beautiful San Mateo County coast just outside of my district. Seven people were killed. The worst act of violence in the history of San Mateo County. Just last week, the Bay Area saw three shootings, two here in San Francisco, one in Antioch. These daily occurrences are unacceptable. Gun violence is an urgent public health crisis, an epidemic, a uniquely American epidemic, I'm afraid to say. It is way past time for this nation to act. This week, I supported, along with my colleagues, uh, discharge petitions that the Democrats filed to bring three bills to the House floor for votes, the assault weapons ban, the Bipartisan Background Checks Act, and the Enhanced Background Checks Act. As was said, I'm brand new to Congress, but in California, we know that gun violence prevention laws work, as the uh, Lieutenant Governor stated. The data on that is unequivocal. We have the lowest per capita gun deaths in the country, but each gun-related death is too many. It is time for Congress to finally act and follow California's lead on this issue and do something truly meaningful about this epidemic. And let me just end with a note of deep gratitude to my colleagues on this stage who have spent decades, decades doing the hard work of advocacy to save lives. And I'm grateful, and I'm grateful for all of you who are working to build a political will so we can finally make a change in this country. And thank you very much for the opportunity. You, Give it up one more time for Kevin Mullins. We got several more speakers. The next person I'm gonna bring up, he's a personal friend of mine, um, solid brother. I'm gonna bring up our chief of San Francisco Police Department, Chief Scott, you guys. Thank you, Rudy, and thank you, United Players, for putting this on. I am not going to stand in here before you and quote a lot of the statistics that have been mentioned already because I think you already know that or you wouldn't be here. And the audience is not necessarily you. The audience is people beyond you about what needs to be done today and moving forward to curb 
and end gun violence in this city, in this state, and in this country. Now, I will support everything that's been said in terms of the laws that we have here in California. Um, there's just too many guns out on the streets today. And let me be clear about what I'm saying. Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, and I believe in the Constitution. But there are too many guns on the streets today, and too many guns that are built for war, not communities. We have to do something about that. We have to. 34 years in this business, I've seen more gun-related death than a person should have to see. And I don't have to talk to you about it because I, if I were to ask how many of you, well, I will ask, how many people out here have been personally impacted by gun violence? Almost every hand out here. Either you yourself or you know somebody close to you. And that is a sad state of affairs in my opinion. This only gets better with you. All the elected federal officials, state officials, local officials here, appointed officials like myself, we do what we do because of you. And it's your energy, your commitment, your activism that's going to fuel change that we need to make a difference in this area. So please keep doing what you're doing. And I know a lot of the names, that too many to call, I won't call out all the names that are constantly fighting this battle. But I will say this, know you're appreciated, know that you're valued, and know that you have us behind you. So let's get it done. Thank wow. you. Thanks, Chief. I don't know if you guys seen that picture standing right here, this brother right here. That's Camillo, right? He lost his life on the streets of San Francisco, and we got his mom here today. She got a few words to say. Please welcome my homegirl, Claire. Good morning. I am the mother of Camilo, who was killed by one bullet to his heart in 2014. I became a member of the club that no one wants to join. So I speak today not just about my loss, Camilo's loss of a beautiful life, but for all the other mothers who also belong to this ever-growing club that no one ever, ever wants to join. All the beautiful lives taken because of our lax gun laws, unlike any other country, and the gun industry is making record profits. When Camilo was killed, I was told that it was just a matter of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I rejected that narrative. Camilo was in our neighborhood celebrating his completion of paramedic school the day prior. And in the years since, it seems too many of us that just living in this country is enough to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when it comes to gun violence. After Camila was killed, no one asked why the kid who was apprehended, apprehended was carrying a gun. No one asked why it was so easy for him to buy a gun on the street. Since Camilo's death, in looking for answers, I have spent some time in healing circles at San Quentin with inmates convicted of homicides in their youth. Every single one of them told me that if a gun wasn't so easily available to them as a young person, there wouldn't be a person dead and they wouldn't be in prison. California has some of the best gun laws in the country and it shows in the statistics of per capita gun deaths and injury. But we are only as safe from gun violence as the laws in our bordering states. We know that guns are trafficked from those states. We need federal common sense gun laws. Again, the gun industry is making profits off of us. We are often asked if a law would have prevented our child's death. That question misses the point. Our children are dead. We live with that fact every single day. But these common sense laws will prevent someone else's child's death. We know that. We don't want any more members in our club. Thank you. Right now. Thank you, Claire. Hey, give it up for that mama one more time, y'all. Right, we all got to share each other's burdens. We got two more speakers. In this 
tragic time. We need doctors, real doctors that have saved lives. So I want to bring up Dr. Shapiro. Come on up, Doc. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be with all of you today. It's an honor to share the stage with all of you as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity. About seven years ago, I had the opportunity to meet with, meet with Congressman Thompson, and he said to me, Mark, we need a lot more physicians engaged on the issue of gun violence in America. And when your congressperson asks you to do something, it's something that you feel compelled to do. For me, gun violence has been a part of my training and my practice since I started as a medical student in Houston, Texas. Uh, we saw extraordinary amounts of people who had been injured and killed by firearms and that continued on in my career in San Diego. And now as someone who specializes in the care of hospitalized people, we see the ripple effect and we know that when there is gun violence and it attracts national attention and it galvanizes the media, that attention begins to fade. But for the person who has suffered the injury and for their family, it doesn't fade. And in my profession, what I see are people who are dealing with the consequences of their injury months, years, sometimes decades later. And the stress and the strain that it puts on them physically, emotionally, financially, to have to re-enter the healthcare system and relive all of the things that happened to them again is extraordinarily difficult. And for our profession to now be kind of recognizing the role that we have to play, not just in the moment frontline care to save lives, but to address this upstream in the prevention space is critically important. Because we also know that there are meaningful things that will move the needle. And we also know, as has been spoken of before, the leading cause of death for kids in this country are firearms. And as someone who deals with public health issues and public health emergencies, that is unconscionable. That is not something we can continue to tolerate and continue to stand by and watch. I have a seven-year-old, and I know that someday he's going to look at me and say, Dad, you're a doctor. You host a podcast. You get to stand with all of these remarkable people. What did you do? And for all of us, regardless of our profession or our background, our children are going to see that graph someday when they go to school, and they're going to come home and they're going to say, whether you're a journalist or an attorney or an elected official or in law enforcement, what did you do to make this better? And when we know that there are reasonable, rational, and effective steps that we can take, as have been alluded to before, it's unconscionable to leave those on the table. And in juxtaposition, we know that when we do them, and we do them together as a country, where we have things that 80% of Americans are behind, we can drive change. We can move towards the future that we all want, and there is no time to waste. We learn in school, right, in the Declaration of Independence, the right for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as we can implement rational gun laws to improve life and to move the needle on all of these issues, we know that as a country, we can move in that direction together. It's an honor to be with all of you today, and I thank you all very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Before I bring on the last speaker, I want to give a shout out to Matt Dorsey, our district supervisor. Thanks for making it. Before we bring on our last speaker, I got to get mine. Us for us. I'll see you, Damian Posey, frontline soldier. There are too many kids dying on these streets. The number one killer for youth these days, 18 and under, is gun violence. Man, we ain't going to wait till we bury somebody and put them six feet under in a box for to let you know how much we love y'all. That's why we stand on the front line, UP, West Bay, educating and showing and loving y'all kids and telling y'all the truth. Stop sugarcoating stuff and tell the youth the truth. Because they dying and it's too late. And so we have every piece on a chessboard that's here today to end senseless gun violence. We got the mamas, we got the, the brothers, we got the sisters who came on, we got the youth, we got the Congress people all here. We got to figure this thing out. And if we can't put our minds together to wrap around it for us to figure it out, then something is wrong with our society. I'm a frontline soldier, I'm willing to die for the cause. I'm going to ride and die, I'm willing to ride and live. I'm ready to make peace fashionable so we can fight against this epidemic that's killing our kids. And I got a problem when it comes to anybody knocking down our kids. And so I encourage you to stay in your lane. Stand up for what you believe in. Because this cause is worthy. If we're going to stand in this stink-ass alley and stand on principle and values, then this is what we do. 
Because like I said, I'm willing to end gun violence. So when I say end, you say gun violence. End. Gun violence. End. Gun violence. This bring up the Speaker of the House, my homegirl, Nancy Pelosi. Don't all of you want to follow Rudy in speaking at the podium? Thank you, Rudy, for your leadership. How many times have we been gathered here? Claire, you spoke one of the recent times we were here. <clears throat> Maddie, we've heard from you. Moms Demand Action, thank you for what you are doing. Now I'm going to take a little different tack. Eleni talked to, Eleni's, um, Lieutenant Governor Kunalak has talked about how leadership California is. Thank you for your leadership. Our members, Jared Hoffman, Barbara Lee, Barbara Lee fighting the fight in appropriations against that Tayard language. Do you know that Kevin Mullen is the new member from San Francisco? We have, we share representation of this district, San Mateo and San Francisco, and he's effective from the start coming there. Jared talks about representing our tribes and how important this is there. Under the leadership of Mike Thompson. Now, I'm going to say two things to you. First of all, <clears throat> it's no accident that California is leading the way in our own state on gun violence protection, p prevention, but also in the Congress. For a long time now, Mike has been the chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. Under his leadership, we passed the bill last year, the first time in 35 years, we were able to pass a bipartisan bill. It didn't do everything we wanted, but it did a lot. Thank you, Mike Thompson, for your leadership. <clears throat> so I'm here to sing the praises of California, but also honor mobilization. None of what we do maneuvers-wise in the Congress is good enough without the mobilization that you all do. Moms uh, against moms have had two victories, what, Minnesota and Michigan, they, they're working at the state level to change the makeup of the legislatures so we can have better legislation. But I have a different message because I've just really had it. Maddie, how many times have we been to church? Amos Brown, you've been there. Right, we, we, in, right in this location, all over. Coming together, we're gonna get it done. We're not going to stop until the job is done. And I'm telling you that with all the respect for the fact that 87% of the people support our gun violence prevention me measures, it isn't reflected in the Congress. We must have a political solution. We must elect people who will help us. And, and, and even if they don't want to, we want them to know there's a consequence if they don't. Now here's the thing, we passed, here it is, we passed, Rudy, we passed the assault weapon ban in the House. We passed this legislation over and over in the House when we still had the majority. We couldn't get it through the Senate, even with a, a Democratic majority because they have a 60 vote rule. So I'm telling you this to say we must elect enough senators to get rid of the 60 vote rule. We just have to have a majority to get rid of the 60 vote rule. And when we do, we can pass all of this gun violence prevention legislation. Whether it's background checks, whether it's age limit, red flag. My personal favorite, the uh, assault weapon ban. Many times that we have been here, we've heard from the moms and the parents and you know we've heard from the siblings of those who have lost their siblings in the Congress and the, in, to gun violence in the Congress because we don't have a bill. But here's what my challenge is, and I keep saying this and I'm a broken record. Follow the money. Big, big, big industrial gun money is what is endangering our country. I'm not talking about contributions they make to members of Congress. That's awful. It's shameful. We have a perfect record on our side, not even accepting any of that. I'm talking about the big money that they put into the political system that is unaccounted for. It's not $5,000 to a member. It's billions of dollars corrupting the system 
so that they can make money selling assault weapons and other guns and the rest, hiding behind the Constitution and the Second Amendment. Of course, we support the Constitution, the right to bear arms in a sensible way. But that's not what they're about. They're about making big money. They're about selling assault weapons across the border. America selling weapons into Mexico and Latin America. It's sinful. It's deadly. And the way to stop them is to win the elections so that we can change the law so that that's they right, can right. be exposed. They're so proud of themselves. Show us the money. Where are you putting this money? They're putting it, and they're so unaccountable. No, no price to pay. If, if your automobile industry, they have to pay a price if they make a faulty car. That's right. But these guys, they can make guns that kill people all the time. No accountability. So we have to think in a much ratcheted up way because too many times, year in and year out, we come together to say never again, we're gonna stop it, not just the big uh, um, events that you read about, but the nightly murders in the streets of our country, harming our people. And you know why? Because some guys are making a whole lot of money off it. And if we could just change the law, which the Supreme Court, don't let me even go into that, the Supreme Court has protected, protected them. But if we could just say, all we want you to do is show us where your money is going. Where that money is. And then we will know who are accomplices in the murder of our children, increasing the number of people in these clubs. This is what it is. We have to really be ready to throw a big punch for the children by passing laws that exposes these rich people. They, they, they don't care. They do not care. All they care about is making money. It's a business plan that they have. The billions of dollars they spend to do this is the price of doing business for them so that they make more money. So are you, we ready to just take it to the, to the ballot box and just defeat these people or say, vote with us and we'll be with you? Thank you to mobilization, moms. Rose, everybody here for what you're doing. I couldn't be prouder than the courage of our members in Congress for what they are doing every single day to save the children. Thank you. Hey, what about Rudy? Let's give Rudy a big shout out. Thank you all very, very much, and what an honor to be on the stage with the greatest speaker in the history of the United States of America. Thanks to all my colleagues. I'm so proud to work with all of them. I'm so proud to be here with all of you. And Rudy, thanks for setting this up. Thanks for all that you're doing. Rudy told me that before too long, there's going to be a basketball court on top of this building, and he challenged me to three on three. So. Moses Moody, my little brother Clay, and I will be back. Thank you all. Let's take a picture. Uh, Y'all want to take a quick picture? We get it right here. We got to take our souls to the pole.